Hey, and welcome back to the X-Files Revisited, and well, we finally made it, the final episode of Season 1. I'm going to do my best to try and keep back the tears for this one. Today we're looking at the Erlenmeyer Flask, Episode 24 of Season 1. Debuting on the Fox Network on May 13th, 1994, the Erlenmeyer Flask follows Agents Mulder and Scully as they investigate a missing fugitive and a conspiracy to clone extraterrestrial viruses. The episode begins in hot damn, looks like damn Duke boys are at it again. Yeah, that's a nice Canadian train they're driving by in Maryland. Police are chasing down a wanted fugitive, and this guy is not about to be caught. The police manage to corner the man, and they do what they do best, uphold the law. Now this is for your own good! The man grabs one of their batons and starts giving them a taste of their own medicine. Not only does he shrug off a taser, he even gets shot and acts like it's a mere tickle. Also, that cop is going to be given exactly what he deserves for shooting an unarmed man. A promotion. The guy jumps into the water below, and the cops notice it looks like he bleeds Dawn dish soap. Sometime later, Mulder is passed out on the couch when he gets a call from his boy Deep Throat. He tells Mulder to turn the TV to Channel 8, where a news broadcast is reporting on the case that occurred earlier in the day. Mulder records the news report and plays it over and over again, back at FBI HQ, where Scully starts to question his sanity. Mulder, you've been through this tape a hundred times. What exactly are you hoping to find? UFOs, astral projections, mental telepathy, ESP, clairvoyance, spirit photography, telekinetic movement, full trance mediums, the Loch Ness Monster, and the theory of Atlantis. Mulder can't quite figure out what he's supposed to be looking at, and Scully questions whether he's being toyed with or not, as Deep Throat has lied in the past. The agents arrive on the scene where the incident took place and speak to the captain. Mulder asks how the body could still be missing after 18 hours, and the captain takes offense asking just why the FBI would be interested in this case. The suspect matches the description of a federal fugitive. Really? How's that? No description of the suspect been released. Why does law enforcement always have to treat Mulder like he's a piece of shit? The agents ask to see the car and they're sent to the impound lot. At the impound lot, they go over the car and Mulder notes the license plate isn't visible in the photo, but he does notice something off. The car in the photo from the recording has a caduceus, which is an adopted symbol of the medical profession. So probably only a doctor would have that on his car. I had the picture enhanced and the plate is different. 3AYF. He had the image enhanced, yet if we go back to the impound lot, you can clearly see that the license plate was visible in the photo the entire time. Mulder believes the cars were switched and they're hiding something from the agents. At the Amgen Corporation, and isn't this guy supposed to be working on robots? Dr. Ivanov? Why are you scaring my robots? The agents arrive to speak to a Dr. Barubi about his missing car, as it was the one that was seen in the report. It's the second car. Please! They should not be excited. Nothing should be touched. I'm sorry, I thought they were friendly. Scully, have you never seen 28 Days Later? The Doctor, like everyone in this universe, is completely uncooperative, so the agents are pretty much back where they started. Mulder says they should check in with the Doctor's housekeeper about the car, but Scully is just done. Who is this Deep Throat character? I mean, we don't know anything about him. What his name is, what he does. You think he does it because he gets off on it? I think he does it because you do. That night, Mulder returns home when Deep Throat decides to pay him a little visit. Didn't even have to use the blue light this time. Deep Throat has the audacity to claim Mulder isn't really trying when he just nearly had Scully bite his head off. Deep Throat, being as vague and cryptic as always, tells Mulder not to give up as he's never been closer. But to what exactly? Well, who the hell knows? Dr. Barubi is working late into the night when he's visited by a pretty unsavory character. The mystery man asks the whereabouts of the man from the beginning, a Dr. Sakare. Dr. Barubi claims to not know anything about him, and things go about as well as you can imagine. I'm afraid your work is done. <laughs> Divers are still out looking for the body of Sakare, but decide to stop the search as they've come up with nothing. 
Just as they do, however, Sekir comes out from the depths like he's Aquaman or something. And if he can stay in the water for so long, why did he stay in the same area? He could have swam anywhere else, but decided to stick around. The agents arrive at the scene of Barubi's murder, although authorities are claiming it was a suicide. Which Mulder isn't buying. The man we met yesterday kept this place like he was waiting for the people from Good Housekeeping to show up. I would never peg him as someone to do all this. Or a Greg Luganis out the window. These two definitely have a way with words when it comes to someone dying though. Mulder finds a flask labeled Purity Control and asks Scully to find out just what it is exactly. Okay Mulder, but I'm warning you, if this is monkey pee, you're on your own. Now let's back up to that flask he hands her because as we all know, a flask with biological samples would have a screw top and not a glass stopper because the glass can't protect from contamination like a screw top can. Anyways, Mulder arrives at Bruby's house and starts to go through his mail. And classic Mulder, always doing things by the book. Scully takes the purity control sample to Georgetown University, where Dr. Ann Carpenter notices something odd about the sample. What are they? Well, they're the size of bacteria, but no bacteria I've ever seen. How do you mean? Well, most bacteria are symmetrical and smooth. These are... I don't know. Just how long has Mulder been inside Barubi's house? Wasn't it just daytime a minute ago? Mulder snoops through his desk finding phone numbers and has another agent find out just who he's been calling. Mulder, completely lacking spatial awareness, doesn't notice the van pull up behind him and the strange guy listening in on his phone call. Dr. Sakir calls thinking it's Barubi and he tells Mulder he's been shot and needs help. Before Mulder can get the location however, a passerby says he's going to call an ambulance and hangs up the phone. Mulder gets yet another call telling him the address of the place Barubi had been calling, and finally Mulder notices the van. The pizza delivery truck has been parked across the street for two weeks. How long does it take to deliver a pizza? Looks like our cover's blown. Let's roll. The ambulance is taking Dr. Sakir to the hospital when the paramedics decide to relieve some pressure in his chest with a needle, but it looks like it released some kind of acidic gas instead. It must have been those damn enchiladas he had earlier. Mulder tells Scully the fugitive, aka Dr. Sakir, is alive and called Barubi's house, but he doesn't know where he is now. Scully has a revelation of her own, as it appears Dr. Barubi had been cloning viruses for the purposes of gene therapy, which she says is highly experimental. Hmm, now who would do a thing like that? She mentions this bacteria may have existed before the time of their ancestors, and he doesn't seem to be all that impressed. Mulder? Yeah. Scully, keep up the good work. Mulder heads inside the building and it looks like something out of Hostel. That movie sucks, by the way. Mulder enters one of the rooms using the keys he took from Barubi's home and it's nothing more than just a bunch of naked people in fish tanks. I was really hoping for a TGI Fridays. Tonight, a show so shocking, so revealing, so unbelievable. What did Steve see? And all new Family Matters. Then... All systems are definitely go. Corey sets up Sean for a hot date at his home alone. Can't you see the man here is on a date? An all new Boy Meets World. And the girls get an adventure in babysitting. Oh my god, it's green. And all new Step by Step. Then, did Coop break a school rules? You guys all in trouble now. <laughs> and all new Coop. That's tonight, here on Channel 8. Aw, Scully's all tuckered out. But that doesn't last long as Dr. Carpenter wakes her up so she can talk down to Scully about basic 10th grade biology, which I'm sure a medical doctor would know. They're called base pairs. Each pair is made up of something called a nucleotide. Only four nucleotides exist in DNA. Four. She does drop a pretty big bomb though as what they have here isn't found on Earth and by all definition is extraterrestrial. Mulder leaves Fish Tanks R Us when he's confronted by some men. But just look at the way this guy runs, and does he have a mullet? Mulder, a high school track star, vaults over a wooden fence and seems to have no issues in escaping his would-be captors. Mulder arrives back at his place, and I guess he just ran home and left his car? Scully calls him about her findings, and he needs somewhere to sit before he passes out. They're saying that it could be extraterrestrial. Scully. What? How soon can you be here? There's something I gotta show you. <laughs> I thought he was going to show her something much different. 
Mulder brings Scully to the same building he was at the night before, and she proceeds to apologize to him because for once, she may have to admit to something that no woman in the history of the world has ever done. She was wrong, and he was right. Mulder plays the whole thing up like her entire world is about to be rocked, and for his sake, I really hope this doesn't all end up being a dud. There were tanks here, and five bodies suspended in solution. There were computers monitoring them. Alright, so the bodies have up and vanished, and right on cue, Deep Throat arrives to tell the agents the bodies were more than likely already destroyed. Mulder tells Deep Throat he was chased by three men the previous night, but if those men were really chasing him, he'd be dead. Scully asks if they were the same men that killed Barubi, and Deep Throat says it's pretty likely. But she wants to know why they would. Dr. Barubi was conducting human experiments with extraterrestrial viruses. Yes, but that's been going on for years. Yeah, come on, Scully, you idiot. You should already know this. Deep Throat tells them this is the same room where the first human-alien hybrid was created, and Scully is starting to second-guess her choice of leaving the medical field. Dr. Sakir just so happened to be a result of some of these experiments, healing him of terminal cancer. You must put together everything that you have found, and you must find Dr. Sakir before they do. I'll have no further contact with you on this matter. The two agents decide to split up with Scully going back to the lab and Mulder on the search for Dr. Sakir. Scully's at the lab looking for Dr. Carpenter, but what's this? She just so happened to be involved in a car crash and died? Definitely not suspicious at all. Mulder breaks into Barubi's house for the second time, but it looks like someone beat him there. Mulder hears a noise coming from the attic and heads up with his gun. But before he can find the dock, he gets Pearl Harbored from behind. Mulder tells Sakara he can protect him, but he does a really poor job of it as he's immediately shot in the back. I'll protect you. Mulder must have a severe allergy to alien blood because his eyes are all puffed up. Scully arrives at Mulder's place and Deep Throat, who seems to just come out of the bushes, tells her he isn't home. Deep Throat tells Scully not to worry though as Mulder is too high profile now and plus she has proof. The same proof that was stolen after Dr. Carpenter was killed. So he tells her he can get her into a facility using her medical background that carries the original tissue sample in the hopes of making a deal with Mulder's captors. Scully arrives at Fort Marlene and she's walking like she has a rod up her butt. She heads to an elevator going to the cryology department which is where Twitter employees go when they can't ban someone for having a different opinion. She arrives at a door where she swipes her card, but a voice from an intercom asks for her name. Dana Scully. Company or institution? Federal government. Project password? Project password? Purity control. She gets real lucky with that password, but let's take a quick look at that so-called intercom because why does it say cold water only? It's almost as if it isn't an intercom at all. Scully enters a room full of cryogenic tanks, and I wonder if Arthur Grable's head is in here. She opens the tank labeled Purity Control and pulls out something rather interesting. Oh no, they froze Peter Dinklage! So Scully is definitely going to believe everything from here on out, right? Later that night, Scully is waiting on an inconspicuous bridge so she can make the trade. Deep Throat arrives and tells Scully to give him the alien, as he's the one that's supposed to make the trade, but she doesn't trust him. He tells her of a test the government conducted on children whose parents thought they were getting a routine inoculation, but were actually being injected with the clone DNA of the contents of the package she's holding. I'm really glad this is just a show where terrifying things like this doesn't actually happen. Scully reluctantly hands off the package to Deep Throat as a van arrives for the switch. Deep Throat hands off the package to the mystery man as Scully watches. No! Deep Throat knows the kinds of people he's dealing with. He really should have seen that coming. Scully checks on Mulder who is in bad shape, but alive. The same can't be said for Deep Throat though, who dies, but not before he can say one last thing. Trust no one. Two weeks later, Scully is in bed when she receives a call from Mulder, and he has some great news for her. 
They're shutting us down, Scully. What? They called me in tonight. And they said they're going to reassign us to other sections. Well, that's not great news at all. And I knew it. Cigarette Smoking Man was behind it all along. The Erlenmeyer Flask is peak X-Files and one of the best of the first season. It's pretty much a conclusion to the pilot, but opens things up even more, deepening the conspiracy. With the death of Deep Throat, Mulder no longer has his inside man, and with our agents being split up, Mulder is pretty much back to where he began at the beginning of the series. This is really where the show starts to take off and becomes what everyone knows it for. As good as the first season is, it really is kind of a feeling out process trying to see what works and what doesn't. At this point though, they've definitely figured out the formula. The episode sits at a 9 out of 10 on IMDb, making it the highest rated episode of the season. Not only was it the highest rated on IMDb, it was also the most watched, with 8.3 million households tuning in the night of its initial broadcast. It even received an Edgar Award nomination for Best Episode in a TV Show category. The closing down of the X-Files and splitting up of the agents was seen as a way to work around Jillian's pregnancy, but Chris Carter has stated many times that he always intended on closing down the X-Files anyways. This concerned the network because they were worried viewers would think that the show itself was also being cancelled. I don't know why Hollywood thinks their viewers are so stupid, but this seems to be a common theme with them. Speaking of Jillian's pregnancy, on her memory of filming she said, To have a life inside you and pretend that you don't? as well as all the hormonal things that were happening at the time, it was very difficult during that episode. The episode's shooting schedule featured a picture of a baby alien on the cover inside an Erlenmeyer flask. This is also the first episode in the series in which the opening doesn't feature the words, the truth is out there. Instead, the words, trust no one, which is the last thing Deep Throat says to Scully. And speaking of trust no one, this is also the first time that phrase is uttered in the series. It's become synonymous with the series and Jerry Hardin, the man who played Deep Throat. In The Truth Is Out There, the official guide to the X-Files, Jerry himself stated, People by the hundreds ask me to sign Trust No One, and I have to assume that my delivery of that line made it something that they felt strongly about. Even though Deep Throat had been in several episodes throughout the season, this is the first one where he's actually coined with that name, when Scully establishes it by saying, This Deep Throat character. This won't be the last time we see Jerry Harden though, as he'll make a few more appearances throughout the series as a kind of guide or in some flashbacks. Overall, the Erlenmeyer Flask is a really good episode and comes highly recommended. Well, that's one season down. You only have 75 more to go. Check back soon as we start up season two with Little Green Men. Let me know down in the comments what you think of this episode and well, the first season as a whole. And as always, if you're enjoying my videos, then please subscribe. Like the video and turn on notifications so you never miss an upload. Thank you all for watching and stay spooky. Of all the mysteries in the X-Files, there is one so deadly. They're saying that it could be extraterrestrial. The government will do anything to keep it a secret. They're shutting us down. Even kill their own agents. I don't trust you. You've got no one else to trust. The season finale no! of the X-Files next Friday at 9, 8 central.